Thank you very much. And uh, I'm really happy to be uh, back here um, th th this time again. And um, that exactly this is our, um, kind of a uh, continuation of our, our discussions about um, um, beyond the scientific um, exchange of, of talking about uh, the, the different projects and different aspects, but also this um, um, the focus of this meeting was basically our, 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 uh, in our previous discussions that um, should be a platform for uh, coming together from all sides, uh, scientists and, and clinicians, and uh, have a, basically a, a forum where uh, methodology and uh, the clinical aspect as well as basic aspects then can be discussed. And, uh, I think this is a really great meeting, so th thank you again so to, um, I can come, be, uh, come here. Um, yeah, I am from uh, Hanover, and uh, as Elena said, I was uh, previously working at the Hanover Medical School in, in, in Thomas Stone's lab, and, um, uh, but not anymore. Uh, two years ago, uh, from, from one of our projects, we were able to uh, actually develop it the way that um, is uh, now a, became a company. So we have uh, basically a spin-off company in Hanover. I'm um, head of science there. And uh, we basically, uh, our, our uh, work is based on uh, one uh, uh, micro inhibitory strategy. And we uh, have a compound which is now um, uh, went over all the preclinical uh, development phase and we are actually very close to the clinical stage. So um, with this uh, background, I was um, thinking, um, how can I give a presentation um, which would actually add to the lineup of excellent uh, scientific and, and clinical perspective of imaging? So that's why I, I would use the time now to discuss a little bit uh, a different angle of um, using imaging as a translational tool in the perspective of uh, drug development. As uh, um, we uh, actually understand in a very you know, basic way, this um, uh, drug development process is, it starts basically identifying the target. And um, when the target has been identified, then comes to the, the uh, most relevant phase, what we are actually discussing all here, that's to, to have the proof of concept of the therapeutic use of, of one um, target and, and uh, a compound which can be used against this target. And this is um, relevant for a clinical setting in, in case of, um, for example, in heart failure. And then when we have a compound which is really working and we know that's safe and um, can be uh, actually potentially go and move on to uh, clinical um, stages, then comes a um, phase which is basically um, um, requires lots of regulatory studies and all these um, uh, checking for safety and, and actually preparing it to be used in the clinical <coughs> setting. So um, when I actually uh, talk about translation, uh, it's basically a um, um, way back and forth for talk between all these levels, which uh, basically starts with um, a one side on a target and on the other end is basically matching to a clinical setting where we actually can see a use of this target as a, with a therapeutic potential. So um, at the target level, so um, this is really a key um, for, from the drug development perspective. Uh, what is the relevance of this target in a disease uh, setting? And is this target druggable? Is there any molecules which is actually able to be, be specific and selective for, for this target? So th these are basically the points for uh, the, the basic uh, research when you start on a, uh, working on a project and then you want to discover um, new pathways. So when you think of a different perspective, can it be one at, at some point a new pathway or a drug uh, against this target. So this is basically what you have to consider. And so when we move uh, to the next stage, this uh, uh, target is identified when we know um, what it is and we have uh, tools to, to uh, mo modulate it, then uh, comes really the cr crucial phase where you um, have to have a proof of concept that it is really 
uh, relevant for a disease and um, the modulation of this target by uh, pharmacological or genetically means uh, can be used as a therapeutic strategy. So I would use a keyword here, this is basically the modeling. So I will very much uh, f focus on in the next um, um, a few slides. So, and uh, the uh, third level I would uh, actually bring in into this paradigm is um, be ready for the cl clinical trial. So, the way that we identify the target and the relevance in a disease is uh, one aspect, and the other aspect is then we have to identify the target population, which population, which this, uh, which uh, patients would be. Uh, actually uh, helpful this medication. So it's in a broad spectrum, you can identify heart failure, diabetes, or, or kidney disease, but within these uh, major fields, then there are also subsets, then you can actually address it, and in depending on the need and all uh, the, the setting, what idea you have, you can actually go over and then prepare back towards all the strategies for the um, proof of concept and also the modeling design. and. Uh, in um, later slides, I will uh, go over all these um, um, points as well. So, um, talking about um, need of treatment, so what a particular um, aspect of um, heart failure, uh, just because we are all in the cardiovascular field, would be um, basically a, a, a which really needs new medication. So, as um, Serena already mentioned, so that the um, diastolic dysfunction and the paradigm which comes with it, the um, have PEF paradigm, this is one um, particular area in the clinical field which has uh, basically very few good um, medical options. And uh, basically this is uh, just a, a summary of the latest um, ESC classifications. Then you have basically the, the have REF, which b based on the ejection fraction um, and you use, yeah, uh, right away an imaging tool, uh, the, the um, ejection fraction measurements as a criteria for, uh, we have REF um, uh, <coughs> diagnosis, and then there is the HEFPEF on the other end, which basically means the preserved ejection fraction with some other additional um, cardiac um, 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 dysfunctions than structural or the diastolic function. And in between, there is a um, relatively new um, concept, this half uh, mid-range ejection fraction, which is kind of an in-between, and there are some diagnostic criteria. And it was important for the, the clinicians to actually create this symptom, because this also needs it's a different therapeutic need, different uh, diagnostics, and all uh, the, the therapeutic side should be addressed differently, most likely. So, um, where are we with the um, HEFPEF and HEFMREF uh, field? So, unfortunately, um, these trials, um, uh, the clinicians will actually just uh, want to blend it quickly in. Uh, these are uh, important trials which were done with different all kind of medications which would be or have been tried and, and uh, successfully is being used in the HEF. REF um, domain, uh, most of them, there was no effect. So unfortunately, the medications that we have today for HEF-REF, which is well targeted, for the HEF-REF side, we don't have any really good ways which convincingly can show that reduces basically the, the major clinical endpoint, morbidity and, and mortality in these patients. There are a few um, new efforts, but this is uh, uh, firstly where we are staying. So we definitely need new research on this area, and we really want to um, get new concept and new medication. So uh, this is basically uh, one first level. So we identify an area where we actually want to have um, new um, drugs. Um, as I said, um, the major point uh, when we have a target which would fit in this area, then we have to go over um, um, this procedure of testing it in uh, animal models. And uh, for that one, I can recommend everyone this um, publication. It's a few years old, but still has a, a very good um, overview of the concept of um, the different um, um, mechanistic stages of the heart failure and, and it has a, basically a very good background on the models which could be actually used and tested in these different stages as a reference 
or as a comparison. And uh, what I would like to emphasize from this paper is that um, the um, most important recommendation that the model we are using then <coughs> should actually show the pathological features of the, the human heart failure. Uh, and this is the, the, one of the most uh, important criteria for the mod model is, is being used. And well, what is also extremely um, important that we have this model very well characterized. That means that we know um, what's the, uh, what characteristics in terms of cardiac function, in terms of um, general well-being of the animal is this model actually showing. Uh, because this is basically the basis, uh, um, as a disease state, is the basis for uh, t testing a drug, t testing the efficacy. So if we have basically well-characterized baseline in these um, animal models, then this is basically the only uh, way to actually identify if there is any change uh, due to this drug. So this is basically uh, extremely important. And for that one, I think uh, we can all agree that echocardiography in the um, animal m models is one of the most important and best uh, method uh, because <laughs> all the uh, advantages is it has. Um, if we talk about uh, this HFEF domain, one of the key um, um, pathological feature in it is, among um, many other things, is the diastolic dysfunction. So um, basically, which you know, the classical picture uh, with the stiffness and uh, increased stiffness and uh, reduced relaxation in the muscle level. And um, then, um, which is, uh, has a concomitant uh, fibrosis, also in the ch change in the extracellular matrix in this, this, um, uh, in this, in this heart. So uh, one model which can pretty much, uh, uh, sh which shows this, this type of features is uh, the well-known TAC model. So this is, uh, I think everyone knows this um, uh, mouse model where um, this um, transverse aortic construction um, is um, basically inducing um, um, pressure overload, which then uh, uh, leads to the um, um, uh, hypertrophy and the remodeling process. And then in late stages, then, then comes to the, uh, the overt heart failure. But uh, what is important is when uh, we, uh, we uh, characterize these models, then uh, we, um, besides the uh, systolic dysfunction, we, uh, uh, can, we can see a lot of um, uh, ch changes in the diastolic function. And due to this, um, um, uh, one, one um, aspect is that the fibrosis and actually the, the uh, remodeling of the heart, it comes to a um, feature which basically can detect it by different, of course, imaging methodologies that can actually describe the diastolic uh, dysfunction aspect of this model. So um, what is really important is um, that um, we have um, a model, and this model is um, not a um, one-time uh, setting. So this model evolves. So as basically the disease is as a chronic disease, it has a progression in um, terms of um, development and, and um, the, the picture in each, each day, uh, stages can be different. So when we use it, then we have to know which uh, stages of this uh, disease model uh, are using and basically the medication, the targeting is, um, should be actually um, in, in line with this, um, with this um, basically a dynamic nature of this model. So we did some um, uh, descriptions or characterization of this um, TAC model, and uh, basically you can see the, the flow, um, the trans um, uh, the peak flow values that it's basically uh, uh, increasing with time, and then uh, uh, with time, so in a six-week um, stage, they have basically a large uh, dilated um, with a kind of a severe case of uh, TAC, then in, in, within six weeks you have already a, um, re, uh, the reduction of ejection fraction. So this is basically a systolic, as a diastolic and systolic changes can be both um, detected. Um, to basically give some hemodynamics to, to it, then with pressure volume use you see basically how um, it shifts um, to this stage. Um, for um, evaluating the diastolic aspect of this model, 
um, in a more detailed way. I can recommend another paper uh, by Schneller. Uh, they have basically did a very good um, overview of um, uh, lots of diastolic uh, parameters, which is actually uh, happening in this model. So they, they use a little bit different, so not the uh, trans and abdominal uh, bending. And then basically, um, as you can see, there are um, many diastolic parameters, um, which are, uh, of course, the ejection fraction is. But besides that, all these um, diastolic parameters are um, changed and um, basically can be used as a baseline <coughs> for your um, characteristic disease state for a potential uh, therapeutic effect. So what you see basically compared to these values would be your, your therapeutic effect would help um, basically characterize um, the effect of the drug. So um, it goes back to the question, uh, this is basically the translational value so that um, the imaging allows you to basically follow the therapeutic effect. And uh, when you see major uh, heart rate or, or ejection fraction, these are really more global parameters, but when you actually see different stages, how it evolves, some of these parameters will be um, t timely, uh, will come earlier or later, and basically you can follow which parameter would be affected earlier or later, so basically it allows you a more dynamic um, evaluation of the, the effect of your drug or the compounds. Um, they also have this um, nice, um, they're showing a very nice correlation between um, the um, classical heart rate, body weight increase uh, with the strain, um, longitudinal st strain rate, uh, as well as the uh, diastolic IVRT parameter, as well as the E uh, over E prime parameters show a very nice correlation with the, the uh, basically the increase of heart rate, so basically the progression of the, of the disease. So this is basically sh shows that this model is, uh, we have a lot of parameter and we can characterize the diastolic dysfunction and we can actually study the effect of um, a, a targeted uh, co compound. So what um, really good in this paper is they actually give a pretty nice workflow, how uh, an algorithm, how we can assess um, uh, basically the diastolic function in, in mice um, in a really, uh, relatively easy way. So the first parameter, as I guess the clinician would agree, that um, if the left ventricle uh, atrium area is um, basically um, not increased, then um, it's unlikely that there is any diastolic uh, dysfunction. And this um, comes to then uh, different uh, other parameters, which can be actually progressively l looked at it and then it gives you basically a nice characterization of um, what type of uh, diastolic dysfunction at what stage, and uh, this is, would be basically your uh, a way of characterizing um, your um, you know, model. So, um, that was basically an overview about um, the importance of the modeling and uh, how we basically um, can um, use this a uh, well-characterized model for um, testing. And I would like to use now an example from actually my <coughs> previous lab, from Thomas Doom's lab, uh, with um, Maria Piccoli, uh, was working on this project, and uh, she was working on long non-coding RNA that called MAC3. And this uh, is um, a molecule, uh, actually a, a target, um, which is um, um, expressed in the, in the heart and uh, it's related, and, and uh, fibroblasts, and then it relates to fibrosis. So it was uh, uh, early on clear that uh, this target, which was identified in um, uh, screenings and, and bioinformatics way, um, basically shows a very nice um, change um, um, during the different phases of, um, the early phases of um, uh, the tuck development, the, the, after two weeks, uh, n not really, but uh, by four weeks there is a nice increase, which basically uh, is um, going in the other direction in a later stage. So uh, basically that would be an example for uh, having a target which uh, actually has related to a disease, uh, a disease pro pro uh, pro progression, and for a, a clinically relevant um, paradigm, which would be then a nice target uh, potentially for um, influencing um, the, um, the heart failure development. 
uh, just a few words about this MAC3. This is a, look, uh, a long non-coding RNA, it's a very well conserved, so the translational aspect from going from the cell models to rodents, to, to large animals, to humans would be um, pretty easy. And this is a, a fibroblast, um, mainly experts in, in fibroblast, and uh, working um, actually, um, uh, the changes are uh, correlates with the disease uh, development. That's uh, basically a, a proof of concept experiment. So, uh, uh, how ta do we target this long non coding RNA? So, for that, they are different type of antisense molecules. That's a third pillar of, uh, of the pharmacology between um, uh, the classical small molecules, biologics, and antisense, and, and all these uh, oligonucleotide based drugs are basically the new. Um, um, a new area in, in the uh, pharmacology field, and uh, they are actually um, uh, antisense oligonucleotide which can develop against this MAC3, and um, as a drug, um, as a proof of concept, then we can show that the classical um, fibrotic <coughs> development in, um, in after TAC then um, can be reduced by, by the treatment. And uh, at the functional level, when we, we see um, uh, st still actually the left ventricular mass um, that which is, you know, characteristics increase in TAC, then it can be reduced by the parallel treatment and also at the functional level, um, these uh, different um, um, thickness uh, morphology, uh, still not functional, morphology changes can be actually uh, reversed. And uh, now we talk about the functional level, then different um, parameters of the diastolic function, uh, the tissue doppler and, and pulse wave doppler, um, you can see um, the um, different um, uh, uh, ch changes, and one of the parameters I, I have it here is the um, myocardial performance index, uh, which uh, move uh, actually increases with the, uh, the, the characteristically in the PAC model, and then can be uh, reversed by um, the treatment. So, uh, as a um, uh, Additional way, way of evaluating besides the imaging is the, the pressure uh, with using pressure volume loops um, that we um, actually checked also the um, uh, pressure change velocity. The mean is also um, basically <coughs> responds very well to this treatment. And we have, um, in addition, did some um, more uh, refined analysis of load independent parameter of. Uh, of the um, diastolic function and the systolic function, and that's you see that one of the um, um, load independent diastolic marker is the EDPDR, um, is also very nicely um, responds to the treatment. So, um, just as a summary uh, for, for the, the biology behind it and, and the concept of, of uh, what is the mode of action of this um, target and, and uh, uh, drugging this target is basically then. Um, as a non-coding RNA interferes with different um, cellular uh, pathways and the P3 and MMP basically uh, which will be generated and as a key for the um, remodeling and then it's uh, through other uh, paracrine factors then can actually reduce um, this um, um, uh, adverse uh, remodeling and uh, what we see at the functional level is that this tolic function can be um, very well um, mo modulated by this treatment. So, uh, I guess that was um, the basic um, si science, more of a um, 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 lab um, area where actually the researcher actually are moving and uh, identifying target and getting the proof of concept and having basically a concept at the end, which is basically a therapeutic concept we uh, have a candidate drug or have candidates of drugs, and then now we can actually um, uh, look at the, um, how we move forward, and then maybe at some point we will have a drug for heart failure. So uh, one, um, there are many parallel ways. I don't want to go over how basically the molecules uh, as drug will develop. I would like more to talk about the um, way how basically at this stage, uh, the development and the clinical setting, the preparation for a clinical trial can be actually aligned with each other. So this, uh, I would call it as readiness for clinical trial. So it's, it's more of the um, design from this target, the nature of the target and the 
um, uh, role in a disease setting uh, and, and the molecular uh, action, the mode of action and how this can be actually uh, useful potentially in a clinical setting. So um, for that one, uh, basically the first stage of the clinical phase is the phase one study. These are about safety. So the first thing when the patient receives the, actually the um, developer receives the illness to actually go in patients, the very first thing is to make sure that it's safe. So that's why the phase one study is about safety. There is basically no efficacy at that stage. So when we want to see whether it is really working, this is the phase two, where we want to basically see some early efficacy. And uh, basically when we're talking about uh, the phase two studies, uh, we need basically um, uh, design it the way that we have information on um, what well, those um, we, we want to see uh, would be um, uh, actually useful in these patients. Uh, this is important because we have to balance between efficacy and safety. So the, the, the drug, the, the exposure of the drug shouldn't be that much that high because then, it, then the, the uh, <coughs> secondary effect, the, the adverse effects can actually come. So that's why this is very important to balance and know which is basically the safe a biologically active uh, dose range, which would actually give us enough um, th therapeutic um, um, window to actually see the effects. And um, um, for that one, this is uh, important to, to clarify it before and use it in the phase two studies. And um, what is, um, as an additional point, uh, before we move actually forward, is to make sure that th this um, context in patient uh, this, 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 this compound is also safe because mo most of the phase one studies done in uh, healthy volunteers. So now we are talking about patients, maybe different um, safety concerns are coming. So that's why it's very important to monitor and, and care for these. And then the most important, I guess, for, for everyone is to, to see whether uh, the efficacy, any sign of efficacy can be detected. Um, I'm, I'm saying that because um, this is basically the key point to have a convincing efficacy um, results from um, uh, uh, the phase two studies, which basically would uh, allow this whole uh, further development, because we have to talk about uh, the costs, because this is a very costly drug, so the uh, data should be uh, convincing also for the patient perspective that it is really working. On the other side, it should be uh, big enough that the investment from the pharma industry is um, uh, basically uh, work to, to, to do and go into the huge, very cost uh, uh, um, uh, de demanding phase th three trials. So basically this is a very key po uh, po point to have basically these this markers of um, efficacy. And for that one, um, the, this preparation for the readiness are, are basically to have to get the trial design, what type of mm -hmm. design is basically uh, uh, been used. Uh, what's more uh, for, for, for here is uh, about the selecting the target population. So I, I, saw, uh, I, I already said that uh, you have the, basically the major areas, but within this major areas, you can have this uh, designed for a smaller proof of concept study with a subset of well-characterized patients to have this early information about efficacy. So you don't want to treat all heart failure patients. You want to go on a subset or an orphan or, or some other uh, smaller segments and test it in this patient and when you see a positive sign and um, then you can move forward when you don't see then abandon it early so that you can focus on something else. Uh, what is very important also to have very well defined inclusion exclusion criteria and the outcome measure. So um, this th uh, last th three one is uh, going back to the you know topic imaging. So I guess by all these three is imaging um, has a very important uh, role. Uh, basically the imaging biomarkers, I would call it all the parameters what we measure and what we actually, the readouts from all these, these um, 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 clinical um, um, uh, so measurements, then uh, a certain um, um, imaging biomarkers. So when we talk about uh, uh, imaging then um, echocardiography and this is basically a, a nice uh, you know, summary uh, picture, all the uh, uh, ways for what uh, basically the imaging is good. 
Um, here are um, lots of cl clinicians, so that the, the main thing in the clinical setting uh, in a regular hospital uh, is basically the diagnosis or, or have markers for the prognosis. So do, do we have some markers which would uh, say which patient will uh, have a worth a chance of a worth outcome? Um, but in the drug development perspective, we have other markers. So we uh, could use these imaging markers also for um, measuring, uh, gauging therapeutic efficacy. So this is basically the efficacy markers, which would be um, basically used um, for, um, as, as an efficacy markers can also be, be used. So here is the, uh, basically the diagnostic and, and the um, um, pro prognostic markers, which would tell us about the um, um, basically nature of the disease, what to expect and guide the therapy, and also uh, for prognosis, and also um, this, uh, for, uh, for the efficacy of the treatment, there is uh, basically another um, type of marker that we need, and also uh, to identify the responders. So not uh, everyone is responding, not everyone is, um, yeah, all these um, subset of heart failure is such a huge and broad range, so there are many, many subsets, and unfortunately, not much in the clinical setting, not much is being considered now more and more, but uh, in generally, these mechanistic aspects of the heart failure and the different mechanistic aspects should be like a guide to, to see which um, mechanism, mechanism where our target should work uh, could be um, used or what parameter, what imaging marker could be used in this mechanistic way, mechanistic setting to actually identify the parameter or uh, to see effect. So this is for clinicians. Uh, I guess this is very uh, well uh, you know, used. This is a few years ago, 2017, came out for uh, the, uh, using for um, a diagnostic algorithm for diastole dysfunction. So it's similar. Uh, it's a, yeah, more more more. Uh, this is uh, more complex than, of course, than the the mouse um, way I showed you in the, the previous slides. But basically, what it gives you is give you you a characterization of of different uh, um, um, grades of diastole dysfunction, and um, this would basically help. To, to uh, have them different, uh, identify different subgroups of, of patients. Uh, why is it uh, important and why I'm actually talking about? Because when we actually see uh, these uh, um, characterizations on, 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 uh, based on these um, markers, um, as well as these parameters, and then you see these this, um, different cohorts, the prognosis of these patients can be very different. So um, basically, uh, in an earlier stage, the survival is much better than uh, in, in, in the, the third grade. So basically, it gives you, you a population where uh, basically this would be a good um, to treat uh, more um, aggressively or use a different type of uh, drug, uh, set of drugs as, 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 as these uh, patients here. So any um, this classification could have a feedback to the, the research side, <coughs> what stages of uh, this, this target development, how the target is basically appearing during this disease progress and how is it um, relevant at the different st stages. One target can be uh, be better targeted in that way and it's not responding th that way or vice versa. It can be um, basically help and feedback to, to the research concept, your modeling, to see which um, stages of your, your mouse model actually <coughs> use it for evaluation of the therapeutic eff efficacy. Um, now I think this is a more of an advertisement section here. The, the new markers which are basically uh, are out, out there. And this is what the last sentence I said, I would emphasize here uh, one more time that this, basically this imaging marker, so uh, the ultrasound uh, imaging parameters is basically the translational back and forth between the clinical level and the, uh, uh, the, the proof of concept non-clinical level. So all the parameters, uh, fortunately with the vivo system, we can go back to the mouse and with a heart rate of 500, 600, can we have the same parameter, most of them, not of the same resolution, but uh, most of them can, can, we can actually have the same parameter as the clinician use today. And this is 
not only the, for the basic um, parameters, but also some nice new features. So these uh, cl classical modalities, um, I think everyone is using it, but there are some new, newer techniques which uh, actually are coming, and this is also, I guess, um, will be added also um, in the lineup for, for uh, analysis for visual solids so over how to actually get actually more and more refined data. So just as an example, what uh, refined data means, unfortunately this is a very bad uh, uh, slide to, to read, but basically what it does, it, it gives you a comparison using ejection fraction and the uh, strain imaging and uh, the basically the, the uh, good uh, side for, for, for what it is good and um, yeah then some, some downsides. This is basically is a very re recent um, position paper um, so everyone uh, sh should actually take a look at it and then basically use and, and also can as, a, as a reference in, in any um, um, preclinical uh, study as a public for a publication it's quite good and then uh, to justify these cool um, new new tools that you can use in these devices. So um, the key point is um, that um, the um, ejection fraction is essential um, for um, the classification of um, um, the different subtypes of heart failure and uh, for the therapy guidance and for HEFREF, I think it's a very good uh, to tool and for. for uh, this domain is it's, it's absolutely um, fantastic, but, but uh, there are some uh, uh, more difficulties to, to use the ejection fractions alone for uh, other areas like all the HEF and HEF and REF areas. And for that one, uh, there are some advantages on the um, um, use of, of uh, strain imaging. It, 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 it gives you basically this uh, regional information about the, the mechanistics of the, the heart function and the, the um, basically the deformation, how it basically evolves and what is really good is that it gives you an earlier marker for impairment and um, there are some studies from already out there which evaluates the predictive value of the um, um, parameters and um, basically more uh, other usage parameters is this less dependent on, on load conditions and uh, some other back and forth features uh, you have um, uh, take a look and, and uh, uh, look all this um, and, and try to actually accommodate in your research setting. Um, uh, in this uh, position paper I, I copied two uh, key um, elements uh, which is more of a forward looking aspect. So where are we heading? Um, this is um, basically, as I said, that from, from the 2D, it's, it goes more of the 3D direction, and um, yeah, it has much more, um, uh, uh, the, the accuracy is, is, is a, is a uh, yeah, key, key point, and um, yeah, then also this uh, automated imaging and different contouring, so that can help to, to enhance the image quality and the um, validity of, of, the, of the results which be being done. Um, and also the strain imaging. So I am emphasizing again. So this is for, like, as a clinician uh, position uh, for the clinicians, a position paper, and with some perspective what's going out there. But I think for uh, the researchers in the basic uh, science and for the animal and the modeling end, they can also very much use these models because these parameters, as I said, is identical or very close uh, in both setting. And these parameters are uh, for example evaluating the efficacy of, of drugs at certain points you can set uh, and identify this point in the model and then can be used um, for um, then uh, these studies and uh, with, uh, basically a very efficient um, <coughs> proof of concept um, development. Uh, another po uh, po point is that, as I mentioned is that moving a little bit away from um, the AF paradigm and get a newer um, method, methods to uh, assess the, the mechanics of, 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 the, of the heart. So um, it's one uh, a very important point which is basically also in the um, um, phase two studies beyond um, looking at as an early marker of change is usually ejection fraction 
in, in phase two studies. But then uh, again, uh, ejection fraction alone uh, may be not uh, the best and many uh, very um, recent trials basically didn't show um, uh, AF as a, a primary endpoint and any effect. But when you actually look at other um, concomitant me measurements of the volume change, in, in, in just think of the um, uh, remodeling process, that's a pro chronic process, and how basically the volumes are changing. And the AF maybe not uh, re reflects the, the changes in the volumes and the um, evol evolvement of, of the, actually the progression of the, the heart failure as much as volume parameter. So this is basically a, a key also for uh, mouse, pig, or other studies that beyond AF, all uh, look at all the, the image parameters. Um, then, uh, uh, the vision uh, is this um, aspect, as I said, for the diastolic dysfunction. We have really now uh, tools for the clinical setting as well as for um, this algorithm as an example, how to evaluate the diastolic fu function. And yeah, uh, feeling pressure in, in a yeah, um, setting where it is um, applicable is, is very important to have um, as, a, as a routine measurements and then look at these parameters and can give you about the mechanism, again, not only the AF, but also some um, other aspects of the, of the heart failure, in, in particular for, for the half path domain. Um, then, as I said, the um, uh, strain imaging is, is something really coming and, and gives more and more um, 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 uh, beyond numbers, gives also a perspective of um, Diagnostics, so basically identify subsets of, of uh, maybe subsets of, of uh, uh, subtypes of heart failure, mechanistic subtypes, and also the pro prognostics. So, so that you, you can say that this early change in this parameter can um, have a basically clinically relevant prognostic um, uh, perspective. So it is also uh, would be good to measure it and in, uh, implement it in or um, um, mouse or, or, or small or large animal studies to measure um, these parameters. And uh, exactly this, uh, uh, with the strain imaging, this um, uh, different uh, 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 subtypes of uh, the hypertrophy development can be very well actually tracked. And then it gives you really a me mechanistic um, um, background to how to actually identify subsets which have different uh, causes, and so it can be targeted also differently. Um, what is um, uh, the path forward? Uh, I copied this, um, another um, recommendations to, uh, basically this paper uh, describes um, um, more on, on uh, the design of phase two studies, and uh, how basically these um, um, different markers can be, uh, um, uh, used to, uh, beyond many other re recommendations, uh, to, to help that these uh, phase two studies are successful. And th this is what um, is a, a quite important thing. So in general, heart failure, no, we have to uh, look basically a subset and that it should be uh, basically a mechanical link and also a imaging marker li link for this um, new, new patient's uh, subtype, which could be actually modeled in a uh, animal setting, and as well as, um, as I said, you have to have really uh, new tools to assess therapeutic efficacy. And uh, this is um, with um, the classical um, uh, blood um, biomarkers or imaging markers, um, NT pro BMP or AF is not, not enough. So we really have to move beyond and then get new um, markers, not only imaging, but also in, in other uh, in the biomarker settings. So, I would um, basically just summarize this um, whole um, back and forth between the different stages of, of uh, this, this drug development and use this very uh, schematic um, linear way in a more uh, dynamic um, uh, interaction between all st stages so that um, the, the imaging is basically uh, something which can be used in all um, inter inter in interaction of all, all stages um, the clinical markers um, can be applied for the drug concept 
and then identifying the patients, and also that basically in the um, animal level can we do all these um, 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 questioning and, and design and, and setting and controlling um, all these stages can be done parallel. So uh, as a summary, I, I took it um, from a um, stroke um, field, this, this slide. Uh, they have a very nice uh, summary, basically the key points what we have to consider is um, to um, increase the effic efficiency of the translation that um, um, pretty much what we, we uh, have been previous meetings and we'll be also discussing how to actually design um, the, the quality of this data and also um, uh, what uh, uh, so are important for a different uh, models and then the evaluation of the models and the clinical re relevance and uh, it also applies to the clinical stage so and then um, yeah this always this question so what about the studies which don't show any effect uh, yeah so unfortunately not much platform um, to actually uh, t take a look what did not work um, and then also um, of course the um, standardization for these procedures and that's I think um, um, yeah we'll uh, go to the um, discussions tomorrow and with that um, thank you very much <laughs>